Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have a very special guest, Charlotte, and I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hello, and uh, I'm Charlotte, the Spectrum Girl. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. I'm very honored to be asked. Thank you. Um, I am um, autistic, late diagnosed uh, woman. I'm four years old and I talk about it on Instagram. That's who I am. All right, cool. So the, the way I connected... Was... <laughs> so the way I connected with Charlotte, um, I got connected to her account via the podcast. Um, I saw her as an advocate. Um, she was speaking on topics that a lot of people with autism do not speak about. So um, I thought she would be like the perfect um, guest for the following topic, which is today's topic is dating and love on the spectrum. And the reason why the topic came up is because um, a lot of the guests, a lot of the listeners, a lot of the listeners are um, fans of Love on the Spectrum, the show. And um, we wanted to kind of get a perspective as parents and as people on the spectrum about what the dating scene is like for people with autism. So cool. you said your diagnosis is autism and you were a late diagnosed. When were you diagnosed? You say you're 40 right now. When yes. was when was it that you were diagnosed? Uh, when I was 38. And uh, so that what is uh, two years ago. Wow. I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit math blind, but uh, I can manage that much. Two years. Okay. <laughs> 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 so how how was how was it that you found out? Like, what was it that you noticed, and what made you want to go and get um, evaluated? Uh, sorry, oh, I, the, it was a bit a uh, crackling sound. Okay, so how did you find out? Um, what made you want to go and get evaluated? Oh yeah, um, well, it was uh, gradually. Um, uh, the thing is, um, you know, I've been autistic my entire life and uh, how I found out is just, um, you know, my whole life uh, went pretty sideways. And then <laughs> one day I, I ended up uh, not able to work anymore, very burned out. And, uh, and that's how I, I found out. But uh, I mean, there's a longer version. That was a very, very short one. Should I try and elaborate more yeah, maybe you can give me as much or as little detail as you want if you want to like kind of tell yeah. us what that burnout was like and um kind of the difficulties that you were having at the time yes uh so um it all happened very gradually i um uh my entire life i had been probably like joking about uh being autistic yeah or saying oh i I'm, I think I'm, I must have Asperger's or something, you know? Mm. And uh, it was always just a joke, but uh, little did I know that, that was, it was not a joke. It was the fact. <laughs> uh, but it, was, uh, it wasn't until like in uh, 2016 when I saw uh, a woman who was like over 30, uh, who was on national television, who said um, that she found out uh, just recently that she was um, autistic or she used the term Asperger's back then and then um, uh, the way she described herself uh, just uh, hit home with me and uh, it was like she was uh, talking about me and this is the same experience a lot of late diagnosed uh, autistic people um, are they have when they hear other people explaining how their life uh, was uh, before they mm -hmm. got diagnosed they all we all kind of have the same experience like oh my god it's exactly like you're describing my life so uh, that was when i started to really suspect that okay maybe i do have asperger's or uh, or maybe i am autistic and then yeah. um after that in 2016 because i was working at the time and had a career uh but it was going downhill very fast and um by 2018, I ended up on sick leave. I had to quit my job. I I was um, bedridden. I had a huge uh, burnout. Or autistic 
burnout, as it is called, it is the same thing as like when normal people have a burnout, except when mm -hmm. an autistic person has a burnout, they're burned out because they are suppressing all of their uh, autistic traits and autistic qualities and trying, they're masking so much. So that's the reason why it's called autistic burnout, because it's, uh, we burn out for slightly different reasons. And, mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, so uh, uh, I found out by um, like becoming, okay, so trigger warning, <laughs> becoming yeah. uh, quite su suicidal thinking and uh, thinking that uh, because when you hear your entire life that you're such a horrible person, you're so rude and, and all you think by yourself is, but I didn't mean to be rude, then you, mm -hmm. you, go, you in the end you get so frustrated and confused that uh, uh, I thought, well, I thought to myself, I, well, I might as well give up because everything I do just comes out wrong. I, I, and, mm -hmm. I, and I didn't understand why everything just came out so horribly wrong when I tried to do the absolute opposite. Uh, everybody just looked at me and thought, oh, you're just a, a blonde, uh, privileged bitch <laughs> and to me that was very strange because uh, uh, I didn't understand uh, people's mm -hmm. perception of me I just and I still don't to be honest and um, and it was very difficult because uh, every word that came out of my mouth was perceived to be completely different than what I meant and uh, of mm -hmm. course so in the end that drives you kind of uh, insane uh, nuts or so for me I just didn't want to live anymore and that's when I got help in um, went to the doctor in 2018 and I said I'm going to kill myself if I go back to work now because I was bullied so much at uh, the workplace and I was in an abusive relationship I got beat, beat up at home by uh, an abusive guy and um, which is also very uh, unfortunately common, right? common for yes for autistic uh, people mm -hmm. that they end up in uh, abusive relationships because of uh, some naivety to to our <laughs> personalities um, uh, yeah being hardwired to not see you know the bad in people I in guess. people mm -hmm. yeah and um, so I my doctor said yeah okay I'm not going to force you to go to work then <laughs> I put you on sick I'll put you on sick leave and I'm like yeah Okay, cool. I, I, I really didn't care at that point what happened to me. So I just went to bed and I stayed in it for one year. I don't even know, remember what happened from 2018 to 2019. I just remember calling uh, a therapist in 20, in the end of, no, it was in 2019, I think in January. And then uh, I was really intensive in therapy twice a week. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's when I got uh, diagnosed uh, after lots of uh, sessions in therapy and I got diagnosed with autism, ADHD and complex PTSD and of course uh, yeah, depression and, uh, mm -hmm. and so yeah. That's how I found out. <laughs> That's a bit longer story. No, it's good. It's good. Because the thing is, um, a lot of people, um, at least now, uh, I've noticed that now there's more research regarding people that have children with autism that usually runs in the family. So yeah. I feel like your story could be helpful to other people because I feel like because women are not as diagnosed as frequently, or females rather, um, it slips through the cracks. So your story can help somebody, you know? So I thank you so much for being so honest and like, you know, open. Thank so, you. How are you doing now though? But you're feeling, you're feeling better. Are you on any medication or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I used to be, uh, believe that medication was uh, not Bad, optional right? for, yeah, well, I, I never imagined uh, myself using any kind of medication, but I, when I felt like, well, I don't have anything to lose anyway, I, that's the point when I started taking antidepressants mm -hmm. and that took away like that, that feeling of, uh, you know, uh, when you're standing on top of a, 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 
yeah, no, when you're standing on top of a, uh, a roller coaster, not standing when you're sitting on top of it, and, and just as the roller coaster goes down, you get that suction feeling in your stomach, that yeah, which yeah. is like this this uh, rush of fear, that, but not in a good way. You know, like uh, yeah. when you do the... So that's the feeling you have when you have... Um, uh, depression and anxiety you have I had that kind of sensation in in my belly like uh, 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 like 20 times per minute I could like never have a single second of rest because I that was the PTSD you know because I mm -hmm. oh, and then the antidepressants took away that edge you know like constantly yeah. being feeling like <gasps> oh my god I'm I can't do this anymore. It was so terrible, but it took away that edge, mm -hmm. and that uh, led me to think uh, a little bit clearer, you know. So yeah. So I'm happy I, I just better. stuck with it, and yeah, I'm a very good. small ghost now, though. Yeah. Good, good. Um, so let's get into the topic a little bit. So yeah. are you are you dating now? Or are you attempting to date? I'm not dating now. I haven't actually dated since I got diagnosed, but uh, I I have to admit that I I feel like I, I get a crushes on people like uh, all the time. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. ridiculous. <laughs> I th I think it's a bit typical for people who are autistic that it's very easy to get uh, uh, infatuated. Yeah, uh, infatuated or enamored. Yeah, and uh, just like it it can last briefly, but also sometimes it can be quite intense but i'm still really scared about my uh the, the my past relationship so um i'm yeah i'm not uh, so you're cautious right now i'm cautious about the dating yeah but uh, and if i would date i would have to want to date someone who was also different like me like on the spectrum as well yeah okay I mean that's fair. So so okay. So what happened with that relationship? Once you once you went through the um, autistic burnout that you were going to therapy and things like that, um, was that some like something that you made a decision after you got the diagnosis to kind of get rid of him, or or how did that happen? Um, how I got rid of him. Yeah, like how did you did you break up with him after after your diagnosis or was it oh, before? No, that was before. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I got rid of him in uh, 2017, okay. and I changed my name and everything. He was really scary, but oh. he destroyed uh, almost destroyed my entire life. So we worked in the same uh, field of work in the same city, so. And he had uh, seniority and he knew more people. And it's the classic narcissist uh, oh uh, story where he really, 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 uh, uh, yeah, uh, did a number on me. And um, yeah, he was a, the guy who, who actually knew who I was before he even met me and had been talking shit about me behind my back with people that I went to university who didn't even know me because that's also very typical that these uh, like um, yeah narcissists that, do that they do like a smear campaign yeah, to make yeah, everybody kind of but stay why away did from he, you but why did he even go on a date with me I didn't find out until we had uh, like our first discussion and that's when he threw in my face and this is the classical thing that narcissistic behavioral patterns uh, do that that they have collected some uh, uh, type of evidence Data. if you will mm -hmm. against you and then use it as leverage when things get hot and then he threw it in my face oh I was warned about you people said you were crazy and I'm like what you were warned what by who what the heck? Why did you meet me? What's wrong? What? What? But then, of course, uh, he had me on the hook because all I wanted was to kind of redeem. Uh, no, 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 not be loved, but to to uh, to, uh, um, uh, to prove vindicate. To him that you weren't... Yeah. yeah, I wanted to be vindicated and to prove to him and to everyone else that uh, th this isn't true. These people who said that they I, they're not even my friends. I don't know them. Why? Mm -hmm. But this is typical that uh, autistic women get uh, called crazy and weird and all of that. And that's just one of 
another one of these uh, typical things about me before I got diagnosed that a lot of people loved to say that I was uh, weird or crazy, you know. But um, oh, I'm sorry. So yeah. That. Well, it happens to so many people, but uh, yeah. I'm glad I I got rid of him in the end. Good. Me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I haven't completely given up on love, though. I I no, do. No, of course. Like, still, like, I I do have crushes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am able to to do. That. But I mean, like that that trust thing has been kind of ruined a little bit for me. You know, like. How can I trust someone again now? No. Yeah, I That's could imagine because yeah, because like that kind of puts, especially because you suffer from um, PTSD. Like you're you're still processing everything that you went through, you know. So um, yeah. I I can imagine it's hard. Um, yeah. I have another little question for you. So yeah, when you start dating again. Um, mm. Do you feel like you're going to be sharing your diagnosis up front as soon as you meet them or while you're still um, talking to them online? Or are you going to be doing online dating or, or you're going to try to go out in person? Uh, I have uh, this uh, dating app called Hiki App, which I'm also, of course, uh, endorsing. Uh, but uh, it is an okay. autistic dating app for autistic people, which I okay. really like. And it's so cool because it gives me hope, but I'm going very very carefully with it because so of course because i am traumatized from my ex but it's mm -hmm. also a higher chance for me to find someone else who is like me you know like or more similar to me i don't want some a copy of me of course not of course. Yeah. <laughs> but i mean as someone who just understands all of these things that goes on inside the yeah. brain you know that, that would be nice yeah, I always, uh, always explain to yes. myself. Oh, sorry, I, I, yeah, didn't, go ahead, go. I didn't, oh, sorry, I, I completely, like, said something else and answer your no, actual that's question. Fine. If I, <laughs> but yes, I would tell someone uh, about my like diagnosis up front, because yeah. eventually um, they would somehow need to know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So um, so there was a question that I had and which we tw we changed because you didn't like the way that it was worded. But the question is, um, are there any things that you find really annoying that neurotypicals do or say when you disclose to them that you have autism? Uh, yeah, it was just the pet peeves that I didn't understand. Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> My, no because uh, I, I think about what is what does peeps mean? Uh, because, you know, I know, I know. My first language, yeah, it's funny. So, yeah, I had to Google it, but still I'm having trouble understanding, like, why is the word pet in there? Why? No, I know. So, <laughs> but, yeah, so basically, so, but just, a peeve is yeah. like, an, like, when you say you're peeved off, that means that you're annoyed at something. And the only oh. reason why I know this is because I'm also a second language learner. So, oh. um, you know, I had to, like, research a lot of these things that people would say because I didn't understand. Because there's no word for that in Spanish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same in Norwegian. It's not a word for that. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, uh, the things that annoy me is uh, when um, other people who are not autistic uh, think they know more than me, you know, because every individual is different. So they can't possibly know more than anyone, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, it's just strange. It's just very strange if someone comes and says, that I'm wrong, for example, or something. It's it's weird. It's a weird sensation. I always, and, I um, never understand that. I never yeah, understand that. Like, how do you feel that you can just like tell somebody who is actually going through, you know, the experience of being autistic, like, no, you're wrong. Like, what is that about? One thing um, that they told my, me, like when I disclosed that my son has autism, they're like, oh, but he doesn't look autistic. I'm like, autism oh, yeah. doesn't have a look. Like, what? Yeah, so after I got uh, diagnosed, I've been very uh, isolated here. Uh, and I haven't really, and then COVID came. So I haven't mm -hmm. actually had the opportunity to like meet people in 
like physically meet people only like mm-hmm. mostly online though but um uh but yes uh, there has been like a uh, psychiatrist even who said that they didn't think i looked autistic which was like what the what yeah when i was um uh, being um after i had my adhd diagnosis i went to talk to a chemist or like a psychiatrist who about medication and who didn't yeah. know me and then uh, she uh i have complained to about her to my doctor after that like oh my god she yeah so that made me very shocked actually and uh that someone in in the medical field could uh, actually do that but yeah also it's kind of another annoying thing is when people uh, don't seem to be interested in in listening to or trying to understand what uh, i have to say about being autistic some people seem to be completely uninterested and that really annoys me too like yeah. because it's so disrespectful to to not have um, any interest for other people like that mm-hmm. uh, who is trying to explain how it is like mm. so that's that's the other pet peeve i understand that yeah. no i would get i would i would be upset too because it's like you know you're trying to share and educate people because at the end of the day like every person with on the spectrum their experience is different you know so and yeah. i would say this on my show is that you meet one person on the spectrum you're just meeting one person on the spectrum just because you know somebody with autism doesn't mean that the other person is going to be exactly the same way or is going to have the same comorbidities, you know, like the same different difficulties, you know. So uh, I feel like through the yeah. show, I want people to be a little bit more open minded and to like actually listen um, and and receive the information from a, from a, from a place of love and kindness, because like the world is already j- messed up as it is. You know what I'm saying? Like. Why should we be mean to each other? Oh, I'm so you know? I so agree with that. It is one of my biggest uh, concerns uh, that contributes to everything that makes me feel sad or feel heartache. Is why are people mean to each other? I mean, it sounds so cliche, but it's like so important. Like, why don't people have more? compassion or show more empathy i don't that's for me so hard to understand why some mm-hmm. people are just mean mm-hmm. just don't get it for no reason too it's like you know but I, like a lot of the time though i i've learned not to internalize that it's like it has more to do with them than it does to do with you you know so um yeah. i wanted to ask you so before you before you stopped working what was your profession before I used to be a graphic designer uh, in the advertising and design industry, but I had uh, so much problems that I had to quit. Uh, so because I was bullied in the workplace uh, and I just couldn't handle it, I uh, had so many bad bosses. I never had any problems with getting a job uh, mm-hmm. because I was amazingly good at masking. So I could just, it's kind of terrifying to think about actually because I, I, I put in so, so much effort uh, to get the job. And when I got it, I actually was thinking to myself, why did I do that? I have no idea how I'm going to keep this up. I mean, they <laughs> loved me in the interview and they, they yeah. look at my portfolio and they think, oh, she's uh, got the uh, cool style. Uh, and they all told me that, oh, your design style is so different. <laughs> it makes sense to me yeah. now. <laughs> I mean, it's. Yeah, I was always doing things differently and people told me all the time, always, that you're different. Someone told me, oh, Charlotte, you're not factory made. And uh, I even made uh, a school project uh, uh, based on that sentence. And um, That's awesome. And I got a job because of it, because somebody said that I was different, not factory made. But yeah, so I had a, a design career and I quit it. Uh, I lost that career also because my ex-boyfriend who was abusive was also in the design industry and he spread lots mm-hmm. of shit rumors about me and yeah it was awful so I just couldn't anymore I couldn't fight it anymore okay. 
So that so when you're creating and you're designing, that's your that's your happy place. That's when you feel at peace. Yes. No. No. <laughs> no. I <laughs> I didn't become a graphic designer uh, or a branding expert or something like that. I didn't be- do it because I wanted to. I did it because. Um, my, that was the only thing that I could get a student loan to do. Ah, my government okay. basically forced me, which also feels it feels it felt like such a, a ridiculous thing because I wanted to study uh, art history. I the first thing I ever wanted to do was become a psychologist or a veterinarian, and, and then. You know, I mean, like I had every other thing on mind except being graphic designer, but uh, yeah, I uh, ended up in the in the unemployment system in my early twenties because I was in and out of. Uh, I didn't get my GED because I'm math blind. I have dyscalculia, so I uh, they wouldn't accept me to uh, university. And that's how mm. I, I ended up in the, uh, and I tried to apply for, for special uh, reasons each and every year up until I was 27 years old. And by that time I was so depressed because I knew that I, I'm, you know, I'm not stupid. That is, that, yeah. I mean, art has nothing to do with math. I mean, I can, I can surely read about the ancient Greece uh, without math. Why the hell yeah. do they, I mean, like it was so frustrating, but so uh, the Norwegian um, unemployment or whatever, they can fund uh, people like that who are ends up outside, you know, of everything and help you with loan to go study. But I had to do it on vocational school because I didn't have my GD. So it's complicated. And that's when I ended up in uh, graphic design because they, they kind of did like a professional psychologist test on me and found out, oh, she is a, a creative type. And I said, yeah, I want, to, I want to do this and I want to do that. And they said, no, but no, we won't allow you to go and do this and that. We, but we will allow you to study graphic design. So that's why I did wow. graphic design. But uh, yeah, so I, I pressured myself to the maximum because I thought to myself, yeah, fine. I just want to do something, just anything. I can't sit around here and do nothing because that's going to make <laughs> me want to die too, you know, because I can't use my brain or do anything. And yeah. So I, I did graphic design. I went to do that and and then I moved to England and I got my bachelor's degree after that. And, uh, and uh, I did really well, actually, considering everything uh, with the undiagnosed ADHD and being autistic and and uh, I struggled so, so, so much. Oh my God, how hard it was. Imagine, I was like, I was yeah. 30 years old by the time. I mean, I spent a decade trying to get a degree, fighting mm-hmm. everything. And then everything, like six, seven years later, went to shit and I lost my career anyway. So, <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Oh, so man. that's why I pursued that career was because the government kind of made me and I thought to myself, I'm not going to be one of those people who is just like sitting and taking advantage of the system. I'm going to actually do something. I'm not going to just sit here and leech off of every. No, I'm going to do this. And I did it. I got headhunted from agencies, the biggest agencies who work in mm-hmm. design agencies in London. And I did that. Yeah, whatever. I did everything as good as I could. It, still didn't work because I was just mean and rude and did yeah I couldn't socially function so I because I was undiagnosed uh, an autistic woman who just said everything weird and wrong so yeah mm. <laughs> so Charlotte what do you do for self-care now like so to avoid you know getting to the point that you're burning out again sleep for as long as I can watch lots and lots of movies and tv series because i love watching movies and tv series that's my escape i and i watch it to the ex- much much more than other people when they say oh yeah i binge watched uh, entire season four of uh, uh, 
uh, Stranger Things yesterday. But I could say, yeah, I binge watched that, and I binge watched five other shows uh, after that too. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. <laughs> it's it's too much. I realize. But yeah, but that's when my brain um, feels like it's it uh, kind of has a. a you can disconnect completely and relax when I do that. It's uh, very mm-hmm. strange. And then uh, there's room to create something in the background. It's like, yeah, it's, uh, two different hard hard drives working. Uh, but yeah, and then uh, do endless research on topics that interest me and do some writing. Also really makes me feel like I'm taking care of myself and yeah. listening to audiobooks and then laying outside in the sun whenever we have sun here in Norway because that's very Mm -hmm. rare and uh, I hate to be cold so self-care for me is to run out and soak some sun yeah that sounds good (laughs) yeah um so when you do date do you have like a type or when you have a crush do you have like a type of person that you're attracted to like like, for example, I like men that are semi-tall and dark mm. skin. So, like, what, like, what is your type? Well, I would say tall, dark, and uh, handsome and all that. Uh, but, I mean, like, <laughs> for, I mean obviously, the, the, the physical stuff is uh, important. And um, at the tip of my tongue, that's what I would like to say, like, like a tall and dark uh, guy that that would be nice um like uh, there's so many i mean like uh, maybe it's more interesting to me if if he has brown hair or black hair or whatever because in norway everyone is like mostly blonde Blonde. so maybe that's why i don't know (laughs) i don't know (laughs) so yeah no 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 but uh, i mean my type is uh, someone who is uh, just smart and uh, maybe a bit geeky and i go for mostly after a while uh, no matter who it is that i'm interested in uh, their personality always shines through and that's what i'm attracted to in the end Uh, they need to just be yeah just be uh, 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 what was i thinking Uh, yeah, just a clever type of person who is yeah. kind also. That's, but yeah, when I think about I'm, I recently found out that I'm demisexual, which basically means that you need to form an emotional connection with someone in order to be attracted to them in the end. So yeah. uh, physical appearance really comes Isn't second. That important for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I need to like connect on, on the head to head level some mm-hmm. in some way yeah that's the type i go for nice so i love the work that you do and your instagram account that you're like informing people like that people on the spectrum are still sexual beings right mm-hmm. and they still date and they still are looking for love so can you talk a little bit about the like some of the topics that that you bring up um i really especially like the hold on let me see there was one that you posted regarding, yeah, like um, sexuality and how people on the spectrum tend to be a little bit more fluid, right? Yeah. Um, so if there... you want to talk a little bit about that, and um, and then we could go into the one, I really love the one that you talked about, deep love and sex education as well. Yeah, let me check out my own uh, content, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the deep love one i i just uh i i remember uh just um because uh i think i mentioned something about that when i have crushes i we because autistic people can easily just become infatuated or have crushes but also when we fall in love we just it have extremely intense feelings of love and we can just become very focused on that person of course everyone who is crushing on someone gets very intensely like feels intensely of someone but um autistic people can uh become quite hyper fixated as uh, and and a person can almost become a special interest and uh 
uh, but not in a creepy way. It's never okay, of course, to stalk someone or push mm-hmm. yourself onto someone. That's not what I mean. Mm-hmm. But um, but it's like autistic people also have very very good long term memory. So if we are like one time fall for a person, we will like always, always, always like extremely remember it. Like, uh, well, me, I cannot, of course, talk for everyone, but there's a lot of people who have told me they feel the same way uh, yeah. about it. It's just so um, the long-term memory. I also, mean, if someone like hurts that, you, that's it's the same. Yeah, but I feel like that's a that's a good thing in a way because I feel like people that are neurotypical um tend to forget a lot of things, you know, like like special things about the person that they care about, even though they love them, it's easy yeah. for them to kind of just you know forget things. I feel like um that's kind of your superpower in a way, like you can remember things that are important about people, and it makes you more um disagreeing with the people that have dealt with you before. It makes you a little bit more um attentive to other people's needs yeah we have good uh we have good memory about uh things like uh uh, uh, things that really matter to to you Mm -hmm. for example we will remember it and um well other people may not really take such great care in remembering small things like that and um, I mean, we're great at like analyzing details and and stuff about people. So um, I guess that's also kind of good when it comes to loving other people. That because it makes us, in a way, very attentive on a on a on a different level. I mean, um, it may not seem like it to some people um, because we show some of some autistic people show emotions in a f- more flat way but it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they are feeling the feelings are flat <laughs> it's just mm. very different ways of expressing it on the outside but yeah and um, we, yeah I mean autistic people can also be very protective uh, like very loyal and protective uh, towards those they love and uh, feel like yeah it's like if someone is not nice to the people they love they will do everything to protect their loved ones you know Aww, uh, I love which that. I feel is a it's a nice thing about uh, being autistic and and uh, caring for someone. I I love that in the in one of the one of the slides that you wrote, you said the autistics show romantic love differently, and while some may be less expressive or not at all, many of us display our love like a straight out of a romantic blockbuster movie. Yeah. And you said I think I may fall into that category. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I I because I I do watch a lot of movies and. Uh, And I have learned a lot about, uh, um, of course, which means I have learned wrong because things are not like they are in the movies. And that's probably why I have uh, failed a lot with social awkwardness and social situations because, uh, I mean, showing empathy and stuff can be very exaggerated in the movies. And uh, (laughs) it doesn't mean that that we don't mean it it just means that uh, sometimes the way uh, i express for example my empathy can be very um, uh, over the top yeah theatrical almost because it's like how i saw someone do it so i have kind of practiced it in my mind Mm -hmm. because i i understand the feeling that we're trying to to convey so i'm trying to do it as good as i saw it so uh it's always the best intentions, at least. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, uh, I think, yeah, that's maybe because we're very visual uh, type of people. And uh, when we have seen some love scenes or something, that it sticks so much in, uh, in our brains. Uh, so, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, so about sexuality and autism, um, I feel like, because I'm a special education teacher too, I don't know if you know that, Charlotte, but um, so here in the school system in America, we don't really teach sexual education um, in the schools that way. So is there anything that you want parents to know about their kids with autism um, to help them out a little bit? Because I feel like there's not enough education in general. And then like, what can we do as parents to help our kids? Uh, that is uh, so important to talk about everything when it comes to love and sexuality and relationships and consent and all of that is like super important to, to talk about openly and without any shame mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, it's uh, super easy to for someone autistic to have shame instilled in them and then for that to ruin everything the rest of their life because we never forget you know and mm -hmm. uh, going to completely uh, yeah so but I never I was never talked to from my parents from my parents never taught me about uh, anything that had to do with uh, Sex. Uh, yeah, sex or romance or dating, never. And I have, I don't, I don't really blame my parents, but I mean, it was a different time, different generation, and all that. But we can really quickly. How old are your parents? Uh, my my mom is sixty five, and okay. my dad is like seventy six. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 11 a, it's, a, it's definitely older. definitely a different generation yeah and um also a different culture you know norway north yeah. norway in the arctic it's even more closed off you know very yeah. narrow like far up in above the arctic circle in the cold up there in mm -hmm. the 70s 80s i mean they didn't have <laughs> the the most Hollywood uh, movie romances, I guess. Yeah. You know. But uh, yeah, that's not what we're going for anyway, is it? Uh... <laughs> yeah. So but, definitely uh, it's talking openly to, talk to the to 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 them about consent, about sex, about um, you know, relationships would be helpful for them. Uh, it's very important. It's a must. You have to, everyone has to do that. Otherwise, it's a, it's going to be like a, a hit or miss. or And it could be disastrous for uh, if they're not lucky uh, going off on, for example, uh, and meeting some jerk who takes advantage. And then they mm -hmm. didn't know that they were supposed to say, I don't feel good about this, you know, because mm -hmm. nobody ever said that they were supposed to to trust their gut feeling and say, no, I don't want to, you know? Yeah. So they just uh, can be, you know, um, persuaded or whatever. It's, it's scary. I have been in, when I think back to my teen years, I, I was in, in so many shady, almost kind of scary situations that I just, barely escaped with luck now that i think mm -hmm. about it uh it was just pure luck that i didn't nothing worse happened to me mm. Um, mm. that's yeah. scary man yeah so, yeah go ahead no i well uh, i had my first boyfriend when i was 20 so that that's good i uh and he was a, a really nice person but i was not in love with him so mm -hmm. I don't know why I even got into the relationship. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just masking, you know, trying to do what I was supposed Everybody to do. Everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. So I just wish someone would have explained everything to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's important and it's something that's not talked about as often either. Mm -hmm. um, there was, um, when I was first getting training to be a teacher, um, we had a speech by a, um, a man. His son was diagnosed with autism. 
and then he ended up getting diagnosed as well. So mm. he didn't know that he was on the spectrum, but he used to do a lot of masking. So his thing, he used to um, stim with his hands. Mm. So because he was in business and he was constantly doing like public speaking, he learned how to put his hands in his pocket and, um, you know, stim in his pocket with like, Oh. coin or whatever the the case was right but yeah. one thing that he did tell us as teachers was that it's important to talk about um sex with kids on the spectrum especially um you know about consent and also you know masturbation and all of that because i feel like because they're they have a disability people feel like it's not okay to talk to them about that but mm. a lot of times people on the spectrum are a little bit more even more hypersexual you know, yeah. than other people. I mean, they could be hyposexual, not sexual yeah. at all, or they can yeah. be like that. Was another thing that you talked about, which I loved. Um, th- you say that people can be like asexual, like not yeah. interested in sex at all, and yeah. that's okay, you know. But like having the discussion with them to let them know what is and isn't okay is super important. Yeah, it is super important for um, for the safety of uh, kids. And yeah, I was never, never, I never, I didn't know what uh, self-satisfaction was, had no clue. I mean, I have to be honest, it happened to me by accident. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yes. I was just, uh, I was just, uh, um, I mean, I I don't even want to get into it. (laughs) No, no, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to like tell me like the details, but like you were experimenting and. No, I wasn't even touching myself it just happened by accident i'm i swear that it's just hard i've actually never thought about how, how it's nothing embarrassing to, to say it's not embarrassing uh-huh. but it's like it's just the fact that nobody ever told me that it's annoying you know like why did yeah. nobody ever tell me uh and i mean yeah so yeah it was weird and so <laughs> As a teacher, I, I've I've seen a lot of things. You know, um, I work with elementary age students, but there's some kids that are are sexually like a little bit more um, aware of their bodies than other kids, right? So it's like we're like stuck in this kind of like catch twenty two where we're trying to not shame them, obviously for having those urges, but teaching them appropriate, like where yeah. it's okay to do these things and when, yeah. you know, yeah. cause um, I, I remember one teacher um, that I used to work with, she told me that there was a, 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 a girl um, who was autistic and she would touch yeah. herself in the hallway, you know, yeah. in front of other people. So, you know, you know, and then she was not, as verbal as uh, other students so it's Mm -hmm. kind of like you know teaching her not making her feel bad about doing that but like Mm -hmm. teaching her like hey um it's okay but you need to do it in private and not at school obviously or if you need to like kind of like teaching the not a replacement behavior but like the appropriate way to do it you know that people won't no, like, I go guess. to the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> or something. So, but the thing is, like, nobody ever talks about it, so it's like <laughs> it's yeah. awkward. I try to teach yeah. my students, especially the little ones, consent from early because you know they're cute when they're in kindergarten, but once they're in like fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, mm. that they're like up to the teacher's breast or like you know they're inappropriately touching by accident it's not like yeah. they're doing it on purpose it does make people feel uncomfortable but like teaching them like hey you need yeah. to ask for a hug you need to like little things like that can go a long way yeah. you know yes not feeling that they're entitled to other people's bodies just because you know what i'm saying um yeah and it all happens uh, uh, uh so i mean like so much can be um solved if it's just talked about and taught (laughs) it's just uh, amazing how it's just being uh, shoved aside and just hope for the best (laughs) doesn't work and 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 this is where i get a little bit this is where i'm on the fence right i want Mm -hmm. the kids to learn about sexuality i want them to learn about consent i want them to learn about all these things but i don't know if a stranger a teacher you know, 
is the yeah. best person to teach that. You know, because uh, with all the things, point. right? With all the things yeah. that's going on in society right now, with yeah. like you know child molestation and all these things, uh, do we want do we want a stranger who might not have the same quote unquote sexual values as you or or your child teaching well, them about be, sex? I mean, uh, it should be uh, solved with having uh, um, a specific, uh, maybe professional like. It fell off. I know. I'm like, oh no, come back. <laughs> I I didn't touch anything. No, no, no. I, I was like, I thought maybe the internet connection went bad or your iPad yeah. died. Oh no, my iPad didn't die. Okay. That's so okay. weird. So okay. weird. Yeah. So we no, can no, we yeah. can go back into that. So um uh I'll count us in and then we can start continue the conversation from there. So <laughs> three, two, one. So you were saying that you feel like a specific professional should be in charge of teaching this to the to the kids. Well, I um, I'm I'm a bit worried about uh, uh, making any specific suggestions here because this is not my expertise. Uh, I have to be honest. No, no, it's okay. Me. But like as but as a person with just, autism, I feel like that yeah. you know you more you know more you know and yeah. and you can it think cannot- about what you would have liked as a kid because your parents necessarily weren't open about sex or relationships so what do you think would have been better for you as a as a child well (laughs) um so um i mean it depends so much uh, from family to family who what relationship they have with with their parents and and all that so if there's never a guarantee that the parents are going to be uh talking about this and teaching the kids so uh, if it, and if they can't be taught about it from uh, family members, uh, then someone in the school system or health system, when you are a child, needs to be there and um, provide that information and that help. And that it could be some medical professional or, you know, some maybe. Um, I mean, they're they're like um, a. a, a sexologists aren't there loads of people who yeah there's sex therapists yes sex sex therapists or whatever who may specialize in uh in um adolescent um educating adolescents Mm -hmm. in um in uh, safety or whatever Mm -hmm. there must be something like that that feel uh, would be uh and some sort of uh, system where you have vetted people and all that before they are yeah. allowed to talk to the children and there must be some mm-hmm. because there's always going to be the danger of predators everywhere I mean yeah. that is always going to be extremely difficult uh, but uh, if you have someone who is who you know is, uh, has been vetted, comes from a long, has a long education and has references and shit. And I mean, like, um, maybe it feels, I mean, it would be. I mean, I would, as a teacher, I would feel comfortable if there is that class, right? But that I'm there supervising to make mm-hmm. sure that <laughs> nothing, nothing yeah. strange is happening. Yeah, you know, of like, course, and that there's more people there. That yeah, that good. is not just, not just yeah, yeah. the one person. Of course, that would be weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, definitely. But um, this was such a good conversation, Charlotte. I thank you so much for being on the show and like bringing your perspective. You're so open and honest, and and I really love. I, I really enjoy what you're doing. I'm gonna be putting your, the link to your show to your um Instagram account on yeah. on the show notes of the show. Um, and I'm gonna end the show how I always end it, uh, which is follow me at Comadreando Pod on Instagram, and you can follow Charlotte at the Spectrum Girl on Instagram as well as well. And if you yeah. have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a Comadregram at my email Comadreando at escthenetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. <laughs> um, feel free to send um, 
any any um feedback or if you want charlotte back let us know um and thank you for spending time with your comadres thank you charlotte thank you don't so hang much up. for having me <laughs> <laughs> wait don't hang up yet thank you yeah.